His title is, is called Health Promoting Effects of Low Carbohydrate Lifestyle and Its Potential to Augment Human Performance and Resiliency. Dr. Volick. Thank you, Carl, and certainly an honor to be asked to give a president's lecture, so I want to extend a special thanks to my friend Larry Armstrong for um, the opportunity to be here today. So I hope most of you are open to the idea that much of what you think you know may not be true, and certainly that was the case for this Nobel laureate who very eloquently stated half of what we know is wrong, the purpose of science is to determine which half. Moreover, uh, this is a quote from Charles Darwin, when we do identify an error in our scientific thinking, it's critically important that we explicitly acknowledge that and state it. And, uh, and Charles Darwin made this uh, very provocative statement that to kill an error is as good a service and sometimes even better than the establishing of a new truth or fact. And I'm sharing these quotes with you because it hits home with me. Uh, I've been uh, studying and living in nutritional ketosis for two decades. And as a result, I've, I've been branded as an outsider. I've been called a fringe scientist uh, and even a heretic by, by my peers simply because I haven't told the party line. So what I want to talk to you today about is an uh, entirely new paradigm uh, in how we think about nutrition. And I want to start and talk about current dietary recommendations and how they have, they are really at the core of a burgeoning metabolic problem called insulin resistance that is really spreading across the planet like an uncontrolled plague. And at its heart, insulin resistant, it's, I mean, it's an incredibly complex at the molecular cellular level. But functionally, insulin resistance manifests itself as a form of carbohydrate intolerance. And overconsumption of carbohydrates, I would argue, is a primary driver of many of the chronic diseases, especially diabetes, but probably heart disease, cancer, and most non-commutable diseases. But most of all, what I want to talk today about is the power of nutritional ketosis and keto adaptation to restore metabolic health and really improve the health response to exercise. So one of the problems with our current dietary guidelines, it, more or less it's, it's a sort of cookie cutter, one size fits all approach. And that would be fine if, if, if we all had a uniform response to the food we eat. Uh, but the reality is we have a single dietary recommendation for a population that's very heterogeneic in the way they respond to different nutrients in food. So we're essentially trying to plug a square into a round hole. So if we look, look a, very, very briefly here at the history of dietary guidelines for the population as well as for athletes, uh, you know, but back in really the 60s, maybe late 50s, and, and through the 70s, we had a, a shift in the way we, you know, viewed nutrition. We had Ansel Keys uh, was uh, developing the seven country studies uh, throughout these decades and was very influential in, in, in forming this uh, paradigm that fat was the problem. It was contributing to heart disease through elevations of cholesterol. And, and this led in 1980 to our first dietary guidelines which were published. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But this really was, you know, started um, the, uh, you know, this paradigm that fat is the enemy. We've even to this day continued to demonize fat as being the primary nutrient that's contributing to obesity, diabetes, and most of our health problems. And this was reinforced by a lot of the statin trials because we were showing they decreased morbidity, mortality due to the cholesterol lowering and that was kind of the basis for low fat diets. They were meant to lower cholesterol. And many of you remember all the fat free, low fat products that emerged on the market. And what you know has very interesting in my mind because I've 
done a lot of work in the clinical as well as the performance side of nutrition. If you look at sort of the history of sports nutrition and what we've recommended for athletes, this really also started in the 60s where you have really pioneers like Bergstrom and Holtman and Saltine who you know, reintroduced the muscle biopsy technique and discovered that glycogen was critically important for optimal performance and this led to the you know, concept of carbohydrate loading. And you have Gatorade Sports Science Institute developed in the 80s, and a multi-billion dollar beverage industry uh, built around this. And many, many outstanding researchers built careers around studying the impact of carbohydrate on performance and recovery. And, and so that uh, really, in many ways, occurred in parallel with the dietary guidelines, and they're somewhat separate but also highly reinforcing uh, in terms of promoting the supremacy of carbohydrates for optimal health and optimal performance. But where has this led us? Um, in terms of our population, we have a massive obesity diabetes epidemic. And I would argue we have a lot of athletes who aren't really benefiting from the exercise that they're doing. A lot of middle-aged athletes who are struggling with you know, uh, controlling their weight and they're developing prediabetes. So clearly, you know, I think there's some uh, problems with overemphasis on high carbohydrate diets for health and performance. And for, if you fall into this category, uh, the evidence in my mind is very clear that you benefit more from a low carb, higher fat diet. And, and so, you know, when you look at this timeline, you have to also recognize we've more or less indoctrinated generations of scientists and healthcare professionals in this supremacy of carbohydrates paradigm. And I'm suggesting uh, pretty explicitly that we need to do a 180 in how we think about this. And in many ways, this is the world turned upside down. And there are many examples where we had firmly held beliefs that, um, that we were just uh, assured that we had to be right uh, throughout history in both science and medicine. And, you know, these are going back quite a ways, but, you know, Galileo and the heliocentric universe, um, it was a pretty radical idea that the sun was the center of the universe, or the solar system. And, uh, and he was ridiculed for that, and Simowitz, uh, uh, was driven insane by his peers because he um, claimed that surgeons should wash their hands before surgery. And even more recently, uh, we have Warren and Marshall who were also ridiculed. And, uh, and this is despite the fact they had definitive evidence that peptic ulcers were caused by uh, bacteria, not, not over secretion of acid. And yet, def despite that, you know, definitive evidence they had. Uh, they actually um, uh, developed uh, uh, ulcers themselves and cured it with antibiotics. That did not change the medical practice for treating ulcers for at least a decade. So we tend to be very resistant to, to change, and, and, and that, you know, I think we need to appreciate that. Um, but of course, they were uh, eventually recognized for their work and won a Nobel Prize. So if we go back and, and look at the dietary guidelines just in a little more depth here, uh, you know, the first guidelines were published in 1980. The cornerstone of these guidelines has always been based on the diet heart hypothesis that increases in saturated fat drive up circulating cholesterol levels, which in turn increase risk for heart disease. And we've thrown literally billions of dollars at trying to prove this hypothesis over the last several decades, most notably the Women's Health Initiative, which was a half a billion dollar prospective study. And there are no smoking guns here. I mean, the evidence is very, very weak that this hypothesis is, is actually tr true. And it hasn't been benign either. There are unintended consequences of this um, obsessive, incessant you know, recommendation to lower fat. And, and that is we've, um, we've over-consumed carbohydrate. And in turn, that is contributing to a different metabolic problem, or insulin resistance and diabetes, which in turn increases your risk for heart disease. And the more carbs you consume, the more we prioritize oxidizing them while we simultaneously inhibit our ability to burn fat. 
And that is a key metabolic uh, response that also contributes to poor health. So I, th I think most of you are well aware we have an obesity problem, but if you aren't familiar with the numbers here, I mean, this is just staggering and alarming. These are you know, relatively recent statistics where you draw the line over here. Uh, uh, we have close to three out of four adults in the US classified as overweight. Uh, I mean, this is the new normal. The average person is in fact overweight and and uh, based on BMI, and about one in three are obese. But what's even more concerning to me is, uh, is the diabetes problem. So uh, this is a paper from JAMA published just last year. It's the latest statistics on diabetes in the U.S. And a staggering one half of adults have prediabetes. About 13, 14 percent have diabetes. So again, the average person now is pre-diabetic in this country, so think about that for a minute. And it's not just the personal suffering uh, uh, that, that is associated with that diagnosis. Uh, it's a huge economic problem. We spend $320 billion today managing diabetes alone. And if, that would bankrupt many developing countries and will probably bankrupt our country if we don't start to reverse this in the next decade. And the, if you talk to physicians and the medical consensus leaders, diabetes is regarded as a progressive chronic disease. Maybe we can slow it down if you pump people full of medications. And that is in, entirely not true. Uh, and I'll show you data later that diabetes can in fact be managed without medication through lifestyle, through uh, diet, and, and to a lesser extent through exercise and you can actually put it into remission and keep it there while getting them off medication. So if we look at dietary patterns in the U.S. over the last several decades, it's, uh, it's pretty clear protein's been stable. We, we actually have listened to the, to the message to restrict fat. It's down a bit, especially saturated fat. But clearly the most salient change in our dietary patterns is an increased intake of carbohydrate about 200 extra kcals per day we consume as sugars and starches. And this isn't broccoli and spinach, right? This is a lot of added sugars and processed starches that we're consuming. And that's not benign. And I, I would strongly argue that is a major driver of, of the chronic diseases, in particular obesity and diabetes that we're, we're experiencing now. So I want to introduce again this concept that insulin resistance is a carbohydrate intolerant condition. Um, you know, insulin resistance manifests in many different ways, but we often measure it and define it based on, its, uh, based on glucose metabolism and, a, and an inability of insulin to, to, uh, to cause glucose to move into cells. But I want to make the point, you know, this is not a binary situation. You don't have insulin resistance or, or not have it. It is very much a continuum uh, and a spectrum where uh, people fall at all points on this continuum. And even within a person, it changes over the lifespan. So we all vary in our ability to tolerate different amounts of carbohydrate. And as we get older, that tolerance generally goes down. And if we look at fuel use in humans, we can, you know, at risk of oversimplifying things here, we can burn carbs or fat. And you know, with current guidelines, we're, with high carb intakes, we're constantly creating a situation where we're prioritizing carb burning at the expense of fat burning. And there's increasing evidence that, you know, as humans, we evolved to prefer to burn fat. And it's a much cleaner burning, healthier fuel to be burning. And of course, you all know exercise promotes fat burning. Um, you know, you could consume caffeine has a mild fat burning effect and thermogenic supplements, but they all pale in comparison to what restricting carbs does. And this is true whether you're a diabetic or whether you're an elite athlete. When you restrict carbs, your ability to burn fat increases markedly. And you can actually, on a very low carbohydrate, ketogenic diets, you can have RQs very close to 0 0.7, 0 0.72, indicating people are burning exclusively fat 
24 hours a day and even during submaximal exercise. And this process of adapting to this type of diet, I like the term keto adaptation, is broadly associated with many different health benefits. Uh, clearly type 2 diabetes, and I'll expand on that a bit more, um, but at the very other end of the continuum, there's increasing evidence that keto adaptation may play a role in certain uh, uh, types of athletic performance, and I'll talk a bit more about that as well. So I want to just define a bit more what, keto, what a ketogenic diet is, because there's no shortage of misconceptions. Uh, so if, uh, this is uh, percent carbs on the y-axis, and you've got several popular diets here. Of course, um, the Ornish diet's a, a very low-fat, high-carb diet, and the average American's eating about 50% fat. Uh, Mediterranean diets are very popular and thought to be healthy. They're a little lower in carb. Paleo's a big movement now. It's low carb, but none of these are ketogenic diets. Uh, so a well-formulated ketogenic diet fits more in this space. It's very low in carbohydrate, generally less than 50 grams a day, although that varies from person to person. But it's also restricted somewhat in protein, and a lot of people think these are high protein diets, but they can't be because protein's f pretty potently anti-ketogenic. They're not low in protein either. I would say they're adequate in protein, but there is a sort of Goldilocks state there with protein where uh, it, is, it needs to be limited to some extent. So it ends up being a very um, high fat diet if you're eating to ener match energy expenditure. And I won't talk a lot about the practical aspects of implementing a ketogenic diet other than to say these are not barbaric diets that no one can stay on. I would in fact argue just the opposite, that they can be highly palatable and in fact uh, enjoyable and pleasurable. Uh, we do uh, very large feeding studies in my lab and, uh, and we feed people ketogenic diets, moderate high carb diets and the vast majority of people actually prefer ketogenic diets if they had to choose and this is just one example of a day's menus. We do seven day rotational <laughs> menus. Uh, so you can incorporate, even at the, the very low levels of carbs we're talking about, a lot of variety into the diet. And there's a lot of perceived benefit, too, so that really helps in terms of compliance and sustainability of these diets. You know, so realize as humans, we did not evolve to store a lot of carbohydrates in our body. If we could extract the glucose in our circulation out and quantify it, it's maybe a t one to two teaspoons. And realize in, a, in an average meal, uh, I'm sure this represents breakfast for many of you, um, you would have more than 10 times that much glucose um, you know, incoming that needs to be digested and absorbed and dealt with. And how do we do that as humans? Well, if you're insulin sensitive, and, and processing carbs in a healthy way, the vast majority of that incoming glucose gets taken up by skeletal muscle through an insulin-mediated process and oxidized. And may be temporarily stored as glycogen, but we have a finite capacity to store glycogen, right? And that's fine if you can, you know, if you can do that. Um, but if you're insulin resistant, which is half, half well, not you guys are not average, so, but half the population, would be insulin resistant, there is very good evidence now that glucose is diverted through this alternative or secondary pathway where it's converted to fat through a process we know as de novo lipogenesis. And the end product of de novo lipogenesis is a saturated fat, palmitic acid, and that gets incorporated into a triglyceride and a VLDL particle and, and secreted into the circulation. And this is why high carb diets contribute to hypertriglyceridemia in, in many people. But you also end up with these lipoprotein particles that are engorged with saturated fat. And I'll come back to this a, a bit later, but w this is a, a highly associated with uh, insulin resistance and diabetes. And it's really the, this alternative processing of carbohydrates is a very early stage in the pathogenesis of diabetes. It's like the canary in the mine shaft. If you had a way to know if your body's converting the carbs to fat, um, it, would be a, it would be very valuable to, to know, hey, I need to cut back on carbs to a level that I'm not um, processing carbs in this way. 
So there's a lot of collateral damage associated with this metabolic processing, and it does contribute to higher saturated fat levels in the blood and promotion of, of insulin resistance. So how do you know if, if you're converting carbs to fat? Um, we're working on some pretty good objective biomarkers, but a lot of these signs and symptoms are all you know, associated with metabolic syndrome and insulin resistance, so I won't you know, go through a lot of these. But we do have ways to know uh, if any of these uh, different um, bullet points here uh, are present, there's a good chance you may have some carb intolerance and you're currently consuming carbs above that tolerance. So this is what a ketogenic diet looks like if you're eating to energy expenditure. Uh, it's a moderate protein, high fat, low carb diet. And if you're consuming less than 50 grams of carbs per day, this is generally where those 50 grams come from. And this permits a lot of you know, foods that normally would be on your ban list if you're trying to follow the dietary guidelines. So again, I don't want to spend a lot of time on meal implementation, but I do want to make the point that this is uh, very doable uh, in the real world. I don't want to trivialize it either. It requires a tremendous amount of education and support and knowing how to formulate the diet and that is not taught in any dietetic or medical curriculum that I'm aware of. So uh, I also want to talk about ketone um, and just some basic terminology because there's again a lot of misunderstanding about ketosis. Uh, I was taught ketones are toxic products of uh, fat metabolism, that, that's from the textbooks. And it you know, really couldn't be anything further from the truth. Unfortunately, I think that connotation comes from the fact that ketones were discovered in the urine of uncontrolled type 1 diabetics. But that's ketoacidosis, and that is a life-threatening situation. Um, ketosis, however, is a perfectly natural process that all of you are undergoing right now. It's, it's a highly evolved, conserved metabolic pathway that was critical during evolution. And you're all producing ketones now. So these are basically acetoacetate and beta-hydroxybutyrate are hepatically produced. And they're alternative fuels, uh, especially for the brain, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, however, if, if you're eating more than 50 grams of carbs, you're probably producing very few carbs. I'm sorry, very few ketones. If you restrict carbs, you enter into a state of nutritional ketosis or starvation ketosis if you're restricting all calories. And that's very different than ketoacidosis, and I'll distinguish those um, uh, further on the next slide. And this process of adapting to a very low carbohydrate when glucose is limited is called ketoadaptation. And it's really a catch-all term because the these are incredibly sophisticated and elegant system we have in place to adapt and, and, and maintain near-perfect interorgan fuel exchange in the face of very low glucose availability. So here's the main difference between some of these. So in the fed state, carb fed state, uh, ketones are very low, less than 0.1 millimole per liter. And if you restrict carbs to less than 50 grams for most people, that jumps up an entire order of magnitude. So now you're going from 0.1 to 1 millimolar, or maybe up to 4 or 5 millimolar. But distinguish that from ketoacidosis, where you often see levels above 20 millimolar. So that's an entire order of magnitude higher than what you see in nutritional ketosis. And if, if you're not a type 1 diabetic, you will never reach those levels. There's, there's, feedback regulation mechanisms in place if you have even basal levels of insulin present. So this is not a concern for the vast majority of people, no matter how low your carbs go, unless you're insulin insufficient. Now, a lot of what we know about ketones um, was, was uh, worked out in the 60s and 70s. Um, George Cahill was a real pioneer at Harvard um, in studying starvation ketosis. And, you know, again, we read in textbooks, the brain is a glucose-dependent organ. And uh, I guess that's true if, if you're not in nutritional ketosis, but uh, George Cahill did some really um, elegant and, and invasive experiments in humans where they did arterial venous differences across the brain. 
and showed when in healthy individuals who were starved for three to four weeks that the brain can adapt to using over two-thirds of its energy from ketones. And the brain burns about 600 kcals per day, or 150 grams of glucose. And so you can dramatically reduce the requirement for glucose in a keto-adapted state. And you can easily make that glucose through gluconeogenesis. So technically we have no requirement, essential requirement, for carbohydrate in the diet. Now I, I, um, I threw this slide in here because it's just fascinating to me. Uh, physiologically, um, and I don't know why, but George Cahill never published this in a manuscript. It was buried in a, a chapter that he wrote, I think because you couldn't do this today with IRB boards. But he took this group of uh, healthy individuals who were starved for three to four weeks, and you can see their ketones were elevated at a little over five millimolar here and asked the question, what would happen if we intentionally drove their blood sugar down? So he infused insulin intravenously. And you can see the glucose plummet, as you'd expect. Uh, they had normal blood sugar, 70, to an average of a little over 20 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, you know, imagine that. I think you know, most of you appreciate that would put most people into a coma. And he talked about a few uh, participants who had, I think the lowest person had a concentration of nine milligrams per deciliter. And the amazing thing is here that these subjects had absolutely no signs or symptoms of hypoglycemia, completely functioning normal, normally cognitively. And so, you know, this plays out in, in uh, you know, in, in just the general population because I think a lot of times when you eat carbs for lunch and you, you know, want to take a nap an hour later, that's, that's kind of a mini bonk, right? I mean, you're, there's an energy crisis in the brain. There's an inadequate glucose supply. It's the same thing on a more dramatic scale, what happens when you hit the wall. Um, that's, again, an energy crisis in the brain. And when you talk to a lot of the athletes that are experimenting with keto uh, adaptation, they become bonk-proof, they don't hit the wall. And this is, I think, the underlying physiology that explains that phenomenon. So that, again, that, that's 50-year-old knowledge we have, uh, and it just hasn't been taught, and it's kind of been lost. But what's more exciting about ketones has really happened in the last two or three years. So a whole new perspective on ketones. And, and this really started with the paper in Science, published at the end of 2012, by Eric Verdon's group out at the Gladstone Institute. So it was a science paper, it was pretty, uh, you know, pretty involved uh, experiments. Uh, they, they show that beta-hydroxybutyrate, the principal circulating uh, ketone body, was a potent epigenetic modulator of gene expression at, or at levels of that you see in nutritional ketosis. And of course, being a science paper, they worked out the mechanism they showed that it was a potent histone deacetylase inhibitor, class one. And if you're not familiar with that, these HDAC inhibitors are really hot targets now in the pharmaceutical world. So they're big druggable targets that are being looked at for anti-aging, for diabetes, for cancer uh, drug trials. And here we have a natural metabolite that is elevated by an order of magnitude on a, on a, on a particular diet that's having drug-like effects. So there's been a lot written about this lately, as you can tell by the title here. You know, beta-hydroxybutyrate is now more than a fuel or a metabolite. It's a potent signaling molecule. So in addition to this HDAC inhibition, there have been cell surface uh, receptors identified, and a lot of the signaling um, pathways identified. And, you know, interestingly, a lot of this um, is, is very clinically relevant. We see clinically ketogenic diets are very anti-inflammatory. There's now a mechanism here identified recently of how beta-hydroxybutyrate decreases the NLRP3 inflammasome, which is a, a, a pretty uh, popular pathway to study in, in the world of inflammation now. And there's a lot of interest in the effects of ketones, beta-hydroxybutyrate in particular, on longevity uh, pathways. So a lot of 
the pathways identified with caloric restriction are the same pathways that ketones hit. Uh, and, and so there are two papers I'm familiar with that were published last year showing enhanced lifespan, one in C. elegans, when they fed them ketones, they lived 26% longer, and one in an accelerated uh, model of aging in rodents. Uh, and so there's a lot of very interesting basic science here being worked out um, with beta-hydroxybutyrate in particular. So I want to kind of jump a little bit now to a different topic. If you look historically, um, kind of going back to that timeline, there was actually a lot of interest in low-carb diets for weight loss back in the 50s and 60s. And then with this new kind of, you know, bash fat paradigm, um, you know, funding for low-carb work was all stopped. And, and so there was literally nothing published throughout the 70s, 80s, 90s. Three decades of pretty much nothing except for a few uh, exceptions. But starting in about 2000, um, which is when I started to work in this area and published some of the first work, uh, you've now got 16 years, a decade and a half, of very consistent research on low-carb diets. To the point now you've got many systematic reviews and meta-analysis comparing low-carb to low-fat diets. So I'm not going to go through a lot of the studies, but here's three meta-analysis. And they all pretty much come to the same conclusion that low-carb diets do at least as well and, and usually better than low-fat diets for weight loss. And there's a lot of caveats to these studies because most labs do very sloppy dietary interventions with poor compliance and they don't understand a lot of the nuances. But nevertheless, with all that noise, the low-carb diets still usually outperform the low-fat diets. So you have a, uh, you know, a very large literature base out there. I would say a critical mass of, of literature supporting low-carb diets. And I'll just show you this one because it's notable. Uh, this was a post hoc analysis of the A to Z study, which was published, um, I think, back in 2005 or 6. It was comparing popular diets, including Atkins and Ornish. But they went back and looked at the weight loss. This was a year long study in the two um, low carb and high carb groups based on the level of insulin resistance. So they ha had categorized the participants in tertiles. And what they found was that if you are insulin resistant, you only lost weight if you were on the low carb diet. If you're insulin sensitive, you lost weight with both diets. So this really fits with this idea, if you're insulin resistant, you're carb intolerant, you have fewer options. Really the only type of diet that works for you is one that's restricted in carbs. If you're insulin, more on the insulin sensitive side, you may respond better to, to lower fat, higher carb diets too. So it starts to move us toward a, an ability to personalize nutrition and identify people who might require carb restriction versus those that have other options. So the weight loss literature is interesting, but I think that's really the tip of the iceberg, that there's a lot of metabolic benefit that occurs independent of weight loss or in parallel with weight loss. So um, the diabetes literature is um, you know, it's interesting, if you look at some very short-term studies, but highly controlled, these, meta these are metabolic ward trials where the diets were very, uh, you know, were fed, um, or the participants were fed uh, these defined diets. This one is a, uh, also a low-calorie diet. So it compared a very low-calorie diet that was very low in carbs, so ketogenic, and one that had enough carbs so it wasn't particularly ketogenic, and you can see the Ketones are 3 millimolar on the 24 gram and lower on the 94 gram. But it was only the ketogenic low calorie diet that resulted in improved glucose control. And, and they actually measured hepatic glucose output here and showed a 22% reduction. And that's, you know, that's one of the cardinal features of insulin resistance is, a, is a, an enhanced hepatic glucose output. And interestingly, that improvement in hepatic glucose output or, or decrease in hepatic glucose output was strongly correlated to the elevation in ketones. And this is another very similar study. So it's not just low calorie. You can't, there, there's a difference between the type of calories. That's what this study shows. This is another very well controlled short term study uh, by Bowden. And they showed after two weeks, 
dramatic uh, you know, stabilization of bl blood sugars over the day uh, versus before going on the ketogenic diet. And uh, they actually measured insulin sensitivity with the hyperinsulinemic clamp and showed a 75% improvement in just two weeks. So again, these are short term and the question that inevitably comes up is, uh, you know, can people stay on these diets? And there is a very nice study from Kuwait that um, had a very, I would say, well formulated ketogenic diet in that they, they, they prescribed the right types of nutrients and types of fat uh, and, and showed dramatic short term improvement with the ketogenic diet that extended out to over a year. So you see very significant and continued weight loss over a year and maintenance of, of relatively normal blood sugar out to a year. So we're putting a lot of the diabetics into remission and keeping them there as they um, you know, were, were compliant with the diet. And I can't share a lot with you, but I can let you know where I'm currently involved in a 400 plus patient clinical trial where we have diabetics on a ketogenic diet over a two year period and we are seeing the same type of an effect where the vast majority of them have put their diabetes into remission, which is, again, more or less considered impossible. What's even more impossible is that's occurring while they're getting off medication and while they're losing weight. Because the usual way we maintain normal blood sugar in a diabetic is to pump them full of medications and one of the side effects is weight gain. And we know that's not benign. So diabetes is clearly one area where we need to utilize this tool, but I want to give you just a, a bit of a per perspective here that interest in ketogenic diets is exploding uh, in, in different areas of, 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 uh, of medical management of different diseases. So uh, not just type 2 diabetes, but it even works in type 1. Um, it's a little trickier because you have to really manage the insulin very um, uh, carefully, but type 1s can use much less insulin and have more stable blood sugars. Uh, but I would say one of the more exciting areas, and this is an area that we're pursuing uh, at uh, OSU, is cancer. So this is going back kind of to the Warburg effect that cancer is a metabolic disease and that many tumors are reliant on glucose as a fuel because they lack a lot of the uh, you know, full complement of oxidative enzymes. Moreover, a lot of cancers uh, and the mutations uh, that occur in, in cancer are exacerbated by hyperinsulinemia. And so we're not only decreasing insulin, we're decreasing insulin action and, and signaling. So uh, it makes an enormous amount of sense that if you could keto adapt, you can essentially, and again, at risk of oversimplifying, starve the tumor while you're feeding the rest of the body. And I know of at least 12 clinical trials now registered on clinicaltrials.gov that are studying ketogenic diets, primarily in brain cancer. That seems to be the one type that's most amendable to the diet. But a lot of basic science done, uh, animal studies. Uh, you know, we don't have the definitive clinical trials yet, but this is something that I think is looking very promising and would suggest you stay tuned if that's an area of interest. The other big area is neurology. And we've known for 100 years that ketogenic diets are nothing short of a miracle in many cases of kids with intractable seizures, even after they've failed many drugs. Uh, but now, and, and we're seeing a resurgence in its use in kids uh, with seizures and also adults with seizures, but um, it's, a, it's expanding over into other areas of neurology. So there's a lot of interest in Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's and uh, Lou Gehrig's disease and even some interest in autism uh, and migraines and so forth. So there's some commonalities um, with the mechanisms of action of, of, of uh, the anti-epileptic effects of ketogenic diets with some of these other chronic diseases as well. So that's another area where it's mainly animal studies now and some small human studies and case studies, but it's, again, I would say very promising and. I think we'll see over the next five years some, some randomized clinical trial results come out. But I want to talk a little bit more about the diabetes and prediabetes space. This is where I've focused a lot of my research and on cholesterol lipoprotein metabolism. And we've written a lot about this. There's a couple of review papers here. And I, I've, I, you know, I've probably done over 12 prospective uh, studies over the last decade and a half. 
And I'll just show you one to give you an example of the type of response we see. This is a 12-week intervention. We randomized pre-diabetics to either a ketogenic or a low-fat diet. And we've measured all sorts of different biomarkers um, related to heart disease and diabetes risk. And, uh, and we see almost across the board the ketogenic diet results in a more favorable response, especially, um, and I think I'll go over this a bit more in the next couple slides, but especially the lipoprotein profile improves. And that might be surprising because people are concerned about the um, effects on cholesterol, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But also, just at the very end here, and I'll come back to this as well, we quite surprisingly see saturated fat levels go down in the blood, and that's really important. And we consistently see uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines, adhesion molecules go down. As you can see, um, a whole range of these cytokines improve uh, to a greater extent than a low-fat diet. I've done a lot of postprandial work over the years, and um, you see just like fasting triglycerides go down dramatically, so does the lipemic response. 50% reduction after 12 weeks of being keto adapted, and we're feeding people huge loads of fat here, 1,000 kcals of like 90% fat. So you, you very much dampen that, that lipemic response, and they're much more efficient at processing fat. And that's associated with improvements in vascular functioning, uh, as measured here by brachial artery reactivity or flow-mediated dilation. Now, in terms of the lipoproteins, I won't go too much in depth here, but uh, increasingly we know now, we have very good evidence that LDL cholesterol is a heterogeneic particle, that um, it's made up of particles of different size and composition, and it's the small LDL particles that are the ones we need to be concerned about. They're most atherogenic. They're more prone to oxidation. They hang around the circulation longer. They can penetrate the arterial wall easier. And nothing is more potent, including statins, at decreasing small LDL particles than a ketogenic diet. Statins actually don't change composition that much. They're tremendous at lowering concentration but they don't actually change the particle distribution that much. And, and that's what really um, helps with reducing risk for heart disease. But I want to talk a little bit more about the saturated fat, because this is a big hang-up for folks. Um, they, they really find it hard to get their head around the fact that you can eat saturated fat and not cause harm. But let's look at the evidence here. And this is important because it's the cornerstone of our guidelines, and it continues to be to this day in 2015, our dietary guidelines, which were just published, um, continue to recommend we restrict saturated fat. And I think it's an atrocity because the evidence is clearly not supportive of it. And I've been pretty active on Capitol Hill in lobbying um, to, uh, to change. And we, in fact, are for the first time ever have a scientific review of the scientific, supposedly scientific dietary guidelines. And that's being conducted by the National Academy of Medicine and it's a mandated by Congress. But here's the evidence, and you know, these are three relatively recent meta-analysis that all ask the question, what's the association of dietary saturated fat and heart disease? And you can see hundreds of thousands of people studied, they all came to the same conclusion. There is no association. Moreover, if you, when you restrict one nutrient, you have to replace it with another, so in, you know, in some of these meta-analysis, they account for that analysis. And, and in here they show if you decrease saturated fat, which we're told to do, and replace it with carbs, it actually increases your relative risk of having a coronary event. And that's what the average American's done, you know, based on our dietary patterns I showed. But it's a little more complex than that. So what if you ask the question, what is the association of plasma levels of saturated fat and risk for chronic disease? And here there is a very consistent association and I could put a dozen studies up here. So if you measure saturated fat in the blood, in membranes of tissues, if you accumulate saturated fat in your body, you will have a higher risk for heart attack, heart failure, heart disease. Also, higher saturated fat levels in the blood contribute to prediabetes and diabetes too. 
So the bottom line here is if you do have a lot of saturated fat in your blood, you are at much higher risk for these chronic diseases. But of course, this begs the question then, what is you know, the association of dietary and, and circulating saturated fat? And most of us would think it would be you know, pretty good correlation because we are what we eat, right? Well, it turns out there's virtually no correlation. And in fact, it's carbohydrates in the diet that determine to a large extent saturated fat levels in the blood. And we, we were interested in this because, you know, again, it was one real problem that people had with ketogenic diets is they're higher in saturated fat. So in one of our studies uh, here, um, the, the, this is the pre-diabetics that were randomized to ketogenic and low fat. I'll just po point your attention here. This is the saturated fat levels of the two diets. The ketogenic diet had three times the level of saturated fat as the low fat diet. And when we measured saturated fat in the circulation, and we did this in a very rigorous way, we measured it in different lipid fractions, it went down in every lipid fraction more in the ketogenic diet. So despite eating three times as much saturated fat, they had less in the blood. And we verified this in two additional studies, in two of them feeding studies, and we did this under hypocaloric as well as isocaloric conditions. So if you're scratching your head, you know, how, how can this be true, how, well, this seems paradoxical. Um, you know, it's really quite simple. It's, again, it goes back to that slide I showed. When you restrict carbs, you convert cells over to utilizing fat. And saturated fat's a perfectly good fuel. So when you're keto adapted, you're maybe eating more saturated fat, but you're promptly converting it to CO2 and water. You're oxidizing it. And it's hard to imagine if that's the case, it's causing any harm. So when we talk about saturated fat, I like to put it into this kind of paradigm here. If you have a nice marbled steak with saturated fat, and you know most of us would have the, the starch, the potato, the, the bread, the rice with the meal, you know, that's gonna cause an insulin response and it's gonna put you in a metabolic state where you're more prone to store that, especially if you're insulin resistant. But you could have that exact same steak and even add some steak butter to it. Um, but instead of having the the, the starches, you know, you have non-starchy vegetables that are relatively low in carbs. You minimize the insulin response. Now you've got a completely different metabolic state where you're going to be more likely to oxidize the saturated fat and not accumulate it in membranes or in lipoproteins. And that's associated with a very different metabolic outcome. So the point is, any discussion on saturated fat, you also have to contextualize it to the carbs that are coming in with it, as well as the individual's personal level of carb tolerance or level of insulin resistance. That's going to play a role too. So this stuff's complex. It, you know, nutrition is not about single nutrients. It's all about combinations of nutrients. So I think we've got to get rid of this idea you are what you eat and maybe change it to something like this. You are what you save from what you eat. So in the rest of the time, I want to switch gears completely and go to the other end of the spectrum here and talk about um, uh, more the sports and performance application. And this really gets more into general health, too. But, um, you know, there hasn't been a lot of research on this. And my good friend um, Steve Finney really published uh, a watershed paper back in 1984 uh, where he had the... Uh, you know, he had this idea that you know, keto adaptation uh, might work in athletes, and he, um, he recruited some very high-level cyclists to go on a ketogenic diet. This was a metabolic ward study. As you can see, they're very low in carbs, and keto adapted them for four weeks and measured performance, uh, time to exhaustion, and showed quite to his surprise, I think, and, and certainly um, most other people, uh, there was no decrement in performance. But what you see based on the RER there is a dramatic shift in fuel use. So at 64% VO2 max here, they were burning almost exclusively fat for fuel as in the keto adapted state. And that's really one of the only studies out there that's looked at ketogenic diets and performance and metabolic responses. And, uh, and this was really never followed up on, and, but never really challenged or refuted either. It just kind of sat out there and people ignored it. Until recently, now you've got 
um, other labs and other scientists thinking a little bit more about this. And I'll just point out in particular Tim Noakes, who I think mo most people recognize the name in the room, uh, who's one of the most prolific scientists uh, and vast majority of his career wrote about you know how athletes need to carb load and how important carbohydrates were and I think as some of you know uh, has recently done a complete u-turn on that view and not only uh, a complete u-turn but it's actually admitted that he was wrong and if you watch some of the documentaries out there he's actually ripping pages out of his famous book Lore of Running and saying this is wrong this is wrong this is wrong and the reason he he came around was uh, I think largely because of his own personal situation and having a very strong genetic propensity for diabetes and despite being a very accomplished athlete developed diabetes himself and couldn't outrun it so the only way he you know was able to control it was to uh, to control the carbohydrates in his diet and that that was kind of the um, inspiration and a lot of this is very much a grassroots ground swelling of, of, of uh, athletes experimenting with ketogenic diets this is Tim Olson who uh, is pretty active blogger and well known to be a low carb athlete finishing the Western States endurance run here and I had my lab group out at the finish line we were collecting blood trying to understand um, this a bit more because these are pretty crazy people running a hundred miles through the Sierra Nevada mountains in um, pretty high heat and you know, uh, challenging environmental conditions but he set a record I don't know if you can see the number there it's 14 hours and 46 minutes phenomenal um, performance came back one at again the next year he's not the only low-carb athlete out there this is Zach Bitter who I uh, would call a friend and somebody we've been able to test in the lab um, incredible athlete set the American hundred mile track record just under 12 hours and ran a few you know ran a few minutes more and set the 12 hour distance record as well and he's I don't think he even hit his peak yet and he switched to a low carb diet probably about four or five years ago Mike Morton one of the greatest ultra endurance runners of all time he's in his early 40s now um, master sergeant in the army incredible human being uh, was an incredible endurance runner in his 20s kind of went off the grid for a decade came back switched to a low carb diet and started setting all kinds of records including uh, winning 100 mile races on back to back weekends setting a record in one of those and set the 24 hour distance record running 172 miles and change and so you know there are a lot of endurance athletes that's clearly where this has gotten the most traction but it's trickling over into team sports I, uh, as far as I understand I would say soccer and rugby are are embracing this um, in particular in Australia New Zealand the all blacks won the championship uh, the championship rugby team in New Zealand last year and and I was quite surprised to find out when I moved to OSU that the Columbus crew were uh, following a low carb diet for the last couple years and they did pretty well last year they were in the championship and I was talking with their you know high performance director and he's convinced that a lot of it was attributed to the dietary shift and you could read about it in other team sports and individual sports this is kind of a kind of a movement um, in terms of different types of athletes experimenting and having positive uh, results with this but as I was saying there's not a lot of really good science on you know athletes who are following ketogenic diets and so we designed a pretty simple um, study a couple years ago uh, called the faster study which was really designed to try to recruit some of these keto adapted athletes that have been doing it a long time and really just peek under the hood see what makes them tick and so we um, we were successful we published the first metabolic paper uh, several months ago in metabolism and I'll share a little bit of the study and results with you here uh, so we we recruited 20 these were very elite ultra endurance athletes triathletes and beyond half on a high carb diet half on a low carb diet but otherwise very well matched same age same body type even same vo2 max so they had the same engine um, but the really only difference being their diet uh, with the high carb athletes consuming over half their energy from carbs and only about 10 12 percent from carbs in the keto adapted athletes and that's really important because here we've got most likely a very homogeneous 
genetic group of athletes that have excelled at their sport. So they're probably, you know, they're self-selected to be good runners. And, you know, their competition performances are all pretty well matched and, met, and you know, physical characteristics. So we can really attribute any differences in these athletes primarily to diet. They all been training a long time. The low carb athletes on average had been on the diet for almost two years. And I have to say, of all the human studies I've done, these were the most remarkable athletes to work with. I thought we'd have to have them sign a waiver that they would never tell anybody what we did to them because we, we had them for two and a half days and we took everything we could off of them. We did muscle biopsies, fat biopsies, uh, collected stool, uh, saliva, cheek cells, um, urine. We um, infused isotopes into them, lots of blood. Uh, we wanted to let, get everything we could off the carcass before we let them go. And they had left thanking us and wanting to know when the next study was. It was truly incredible. So here's um, the peak fat oxidation. So this is the maximum amount of fat they were burning during progressive intensity exercise. And you can see the numbers here in the high carb group. And just for comparison, these are really high numbers. These were really healthy elite athletes. Um, so you know, 0.7 grams per minute is a very high fat burning rate. And if you look in the literature, about the highest rate you, I've ever found in any study ever reported is, is one gram per minute. Like that's kind of the ceiling, or the expected ceiling in a human being. And here's the fat burning we reported in the keto adapted athletes. So literally twofold higher rates of fat burning than their high carb counterparts. So this really drives home the point that if you want to maximize fat burning, training doesn't do it. I mean, it helps, it certainly does. But to take it to a whole nother level, it requires a level of carb restriction. And when you look at fat burning as a function of exercise intensity, you see a curve like this where it's not just at peak fat burning, but it's over this whole spectrum of exercise intensities. And you even push the fat burning out to higher intensities in the keto adapted state. And, we, and the primary exercise test we did was a three hour run on the treadmill at 64% VO2 max. And you see a pretty typical response on the left. High carb athletes burn a mix of carbs and fat. But nearly 90% of the fuel came from fat in the keto adapted state. So, um, you know, very stable fuel source there. They're burning, you know, their body fat for fuel. And that's what makes them be able to go for 10, 15 hours much more efficiently than the high carb athletes who have to depend on consuming exogenous forms of carbs and gels and drinks, which can work, but it's pretty rough on the GI track for these athletes and it's kind of punishing their bodies, I would argue, over years and decades. Uh, here's their ketone levels. As you'd expect, they were quite a bit higher and you get the post-exercise <coughs> ketosis. We did a lot of circulating measures. I won't go through a lot of them, but just to show you glycerol as sort of an indicator of adipose tissue lipolysis was almost twofold higher. So that makes sense. They were more effectively breaking down uh, their peripheral fat stores. But one of the most unexpected findings in my really entire scientific career, and I'm still scratching my head a bit about this, is the glycogen data. So essentially we show no difference at all between high carb and keto adapted athletes in resting, immediate post-exercise, and two hour post-exercise glycogen measures. So this is, uh, and I won't get into a lot of speculation here, we have some ideas what might be happening, but there's no doubt profound adaptations here in glycogen metabolism in the keto adapted state. And clearly they're not using this glycogen for fuel. If you start to do the uh, the, some calculations on the amount of glucose available from glycogen here, uh, it's over 100 grams more than the total glucose they oxidize. So you have to ask the question, where's it going? And it's clearly not being terminally oxidized, but we think there are reasons that the keto adapted athlete would break down glycogen for other purposes f than ATP generation. And you can see it's very consistent. This isn't a couple athletes driving the means here. That It's a very uniform response. The standard deviation on the resynthesis rates are one-third they are here in the high carb. So it's very uniform. 
And it's amazing, there's no carbs provided really after exercise and yet they're resynthesizing carbs and we think that may be lactate or glycerol being used as a precursor for glycogen. Uh, we've got a lot of other data in this study that we didn't include in the first paper, including um, one of my doctoral students, Kathy Sines, had a poster here, um, I think the other day, uh, on the gene responses. So we did a whole transcriptome analysis from skeletal muscle, uh, which is really the proverbial fire hose in the face of data. We were quantifiable data on 25,000 plus genes. And there's clearly a set of genes that are I, the way I view it is they're basically put to sleep by carbs and when you restrict carbs these genes suddenly upregulate. And it's, it's interesting when you look at the different pathways they're involved with. Some of them make a lot of sense if they're related, as they're related to lipid oxidation, but others um, kind of maybe provide some insight into other aspects of keto adaptation. Uh, so these are just a couple of the genes I'll, I'll skip through that were the most significant. We also did um, a targeted metabolomic analysis from skeletal muscle, and this was a little more easier to get your head around. We were able to, uh, to measure 378 compounds of known identity with the metabolomic analysis, and of those, almost one-third were significantly affected by diet. And these were you know, as you would expect, related to metabolism and fatty acid oxidation, ketogenesis, and carbohydrate, and even amino acid metabolism. So this is a very profound stimulus for changing metabolism here based on this metabolome, or skeletal muscle metabolome. And we've kind of stayed in touch with a lot of the athletes. I'll just point out that at least two that we know of, of the high carb athletes that participated in our study, um, communicated with us and switched to a low-carb diet after the study. And I'll let you kind of read through the quote here, but it's pretty clear they've, they had a very transformative experience to switching over. And, and here's the other quote from another high-carb participant who switched and won a 100-mile trail race uh, and set a record. So. Uh, Again, this is more than a few testimonials and anecdotes, but we do need a lot more science on this. Uh, and we've, we have dabbled in this before this study in terms of a resistance training study we did a while back. And so there are high intensity athletes can do this as well, where we had um, college aged men do a resistance training study with a low carb or low fat diet. And we also had a group that didn't train. And this is the change in body comp. And, Basically, the group that trained and consumed a low-carb ketogenic diet had the greatest improvement in body composition. So they lost the most fat, and they actually gained some muscle, uh, translating into you know, these larger reductions in percent body fat. And no compromise in strength gains and improvements in other um, cardiometabolic risk factors. And I think I'm running out of time, so I won't go through these in great detail. but. Um, you know, there are a lot of reasons we need to reconsider low-carb ketogenic diets for athletes, not just based on the fact that there are a lot of anecdotal um, data out there to, that are certainly provocative, but there are a lot of metabolic and physiologic reasons why it makes more sense to be in a fat-adapted state or keto-adapted state. And so this is not simple stuff. There's a lot of physiology to sort out here. And that's kind of the point I want to make um, in the next slide here, but I just wanted to state here, uh, you know, this is more than just helping athletes run a marathon or triathlon a little bit faster. There's a tremendous application here, I think, for other um, professions that are physically demanding, in particular our military uh, and our special operations soldiers who are facing multifaceted stressors, physical, cognitive, emotional, environmental, uh, etc. And basically being keto adapted enhances your ability to cope with stress and to be more resilient. And so we've got some studies underway to, to, uh, to try to understand this a bit better and see which aspects might be most relevant for soldiers. And again, this is not 
you know, as scientists, we're all trained as reductionists. And, and you know, that just doesn't help much in understanding complex stimuli like, like diet and even exercise. So this is not working through one receptor or one pathway. This is very pleiotropic in the way ketogenic diets and keto adaptations affects outcomes like performance, like metabolic health, like recovery. And so there's a lot to sort out here uh, in terms of ongoing and future research. So with that, I, uh, I hope I convinced you um, a little bit to uh, appreciate that, you know, carbs are great. I love carbs as much as anybody, but we all don't tolerate carbs in the same way. And, and when we're over consuming carbs above a level we can oxidize, that is causing a lot of problems, a lot of metabolic problems, not just obesity and diabetes. And from that, the logical approach to managing or improving health is to restrict carbs. And not everybody needs to restrict carbs to a ketogenic diet. This is where personalized nutrition is so important. But it is worthwhile to make the point that ketogenic diets are uniquely potent at restoring metabolic health, if you, especially if you are diabetic or, or highly insulin resistant. And again, this is variable across the board. Um, and everyone needs to kind of figure out what their own carb tolerance is. And you need to be aware it may change over time, where in your 20s you do fine with high carb diets. In your 40s and 50s, suddenly you're developing metabolic syndrome. And so it does change. It's a bit of a moving target within a person as well. So finally, I, I have so many people I'm grateful for. Um, I won't list all these and go through names, but I will point out I've had tremendous um, students and team members that um, you know all this research was pretty much done on their backs, so I, I can't thank all of the students enough. And I've had some really key collaborators. Uh, I'll just mention a few by name. William Kramer, Steve Finney, and Carl Marish. Um, you know, really just so supportive of all this work and, and even better friends. And my wife, too, has been a big part of a lot of this science uh, and been supportive uh, of, of all this work and my travel and obsession with this topic. So with that, I'll uh, stop. And if I'm permitted to take questions, if there's time, I'll be happy to do that.